the Lax Factor Podcast. What is up, College of Cross fans? You're watching the 250th episode of the Lax Factor Podcast. I'm your host, Ted Hoost, and today we're going to talk about a bunch of Division I lacrosse games that are being played this weekend between Friday and Saturday. Actually, there's one on Sunday, Ohio State, Penn State, that we're going to talk about. But more importantly, we're going to talk a little bit of a D2 action here as we had a crazy finish last night between Frostburg State and Seton Hill. So I'm going to talk about that game as well. Before I get into it, as always, be sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you're notified when we put videos out on YouTube, if you're a YouTube watcher, if you're an audio listener, or if you watch on Spotify. All I ask is share the crap out of the podcast with everybody. Spread the word. We're up to, what, 10,400 subscribers or so on YouTube, and then we have thousands of subscribers across all the other platforms and podcast platforms and everything like that. So thank you for uh, sharing your uh, wealth. And to me, your, the wealth is your eyeballs. Uh, as always, you can go to laxfactor.com if you have needs for custom team apparel. You can go to laxfactor.com, request a custom quote between uh, uniforms, reversibles, everything's dye sublimated, designed in America, cut and sewn in America, and then shipped off to you. So it's all American made, and then you can also just support the podcast by going to the website, laxfactor.com, watching our videos there. We post everything we put up there. We've got uh, podcast-related apparel as well as just rando t-shirts and crap like that. So let me shut up here. I want to talk about this game here. I, I, I pay attention to Seton Hill because there's a. am from Whitney Point, and uh, I'm also played in Section 4, so both of those lacrosse spheres are important to me. And uh, Andy Davis, he's a Whitney Pointer. Uh, he plays for Seton Hill, so I've kind of followed his career career as he's played through but this was a crazy game here because Seton Hill if I can find it here all right so Seton Hill was up 13 to 8 with 7 minutes and 18 seconds left to play in the game you'd, you'd pretty much as a coach feel pretty good about that lead with 7 minutes left it's not unheard of that a team could come back and beat you what is unheard of though is that Zostant here, he scores with 6.18 left to get the lead to 13-9. To with just over one minute and a half to play in the game, the Griffins, as in Seton Hill, ran off four goals in just over 30 seconds to, t to tie the score at 13 and then to force overtime here. Zostant and Cogla Cl Cogliandro scored the first two goals to get them back to within two goals. Then, for, why do the D2 and D3 guys have such weird and hard names to pronounce? Like I said, I think I'm right about the fact that all the weird named kids get put down in D2 and D3. Uh, this Forzo, we're gonna, I'm going to guess that S is silent. We're going to call him Forzo. He then picked up a ground ball off a save, scored to cut the lead to one, and then Mark Skrunk, uh, Strunk, who had a very good game at the faceoff dot, he wins the ensuing faceoff and scores with 108 to play to tie the game at 13s, and then the the Griffins were able to get a final stop to force overtime, and then in overtime, Cage Williams caused a turnover after the Griffins couldn't score in their first possession. The Bobcats took a tripping penalty with 152 left to play in that overtime period. My man Andy Davis took a shot. Shot was saved off the rebound. Cogliandro grabbed the ground ball put it back with 102 left in the overtime period, and Seton Hill walked off uh, for the win. So that is a pretty insane sequence to win that game. And as we see here, Seton Hill was down 13-9 to with 7-18 left, or 13-8 to with 7-18 left to play. Over the final six minutes, they rattled off six goals. That's impressive in itself. But as we see here, between 133 and and 108, under 30 seconds, they rattle off those five goals there. Did I do that math right? Uh, they rattle off those five goals, and that's got to be one of the crazier comebacks that I've seen in college across overall. So credit to Seton Hill. That was pretty dope, and now I'm going to shut up about that, and we're going to move on, and we're going to talk about the very first Division One game. This game is the Friday night ACC game. It's got all the dope storylines that you would expect from a Friday night ACC tilt. We've got number four Duke playing at number one Virginia in Charlottesville. It's the Twarton candidates, Connor Schellenberger, playing against Brennan O'Neill on the opposite side, the number one ranked team in the country, the number four ranked team in the country. Both teams are coming into this game with only one loss, and both teams have a ton of roster depth at every position. This is going to be a must-watch game here, especially because it's a nightcap here. Uh, oh, no, it's not. It's played at 5 on Friday. Looks like I'm going to have to knock off before 5 on Friday and start sipping on some beers to watch this one. Now, the matchups to watch in this game. Connor Schellenberger against Kenny Brower. 
a team's best defender doesn't always match up with a team's best offensive threat. I suspect that Brower will be all up in Schellenberger's crap all day on Friday night, though. Shelly did a good job against Notre Dame. Chris Fake primarily guarded Schellenberger in that game against Notre Dame, and Fake being a very physical, beat-you-up kind of defender, Schellenberger did a great job of being mobile, not trying to dodge into Fake's body, but a lot of lateral dodges, a lot of changes of direction to keep his hands free, and it worked incredibly well for Schellenberger, both for his stat line and for his team. He puts up two goals and five assists in that game. I think the game plan against Brower is going to be similar. I think Brower is a slightly better cover guy. He's not going to beat you up quite as much as Fake is, but he's very physical, but I, I do think Brower is a better overall cover guy than Fake is. So I think Brower will probably fare well against Schellenberger, but if Schellenberger plays plays the same style of game that he played against Fake, I think that will play well for him against Brower as well. I Once again, though, if I'm making predictions, I like to make predictions just so I can be wrong and everyone can chirp me. I don't see Schellenberger going for seven points in this game against Brower. I think he's going to be somewhere in between three to six points or whatnot. I think he's going to get his because he's playing well and because he needs to play well for Virginia to win through this stretch now that they're in ACC play. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's going to be an incredible matchup to watch overall. Another matchup to watch, Brennan O'Neill versus whoever guards him. I'm not sure who who UVA will put on O'Neill. Could it be Sawstead? Could it be Bauer? Both of them are big, strong defenders, and they can guard pretty much any, any type of player. They proved last week that even though Bauer and Sawstead are – large, tall, lanky, long guys, they can guard the little jitterbug hobbit attackmen that kill people as well. Virginia overall, one of the biggest, longest, and rangy defenses in the country. They have a couple of guys that they could put on O'Neal overall. All have decent size, with Sawstead being the biggest at 6'5", but in the end, it's whoever does the best job guarding big lefties. Lefties are weird because, you know, as a, as a coach, and as for those of you who coach who are watching, you don't always put your best defender on that lefty. Sometimes you end up having, let's say your best defender is a left-handed player. Maybe that's a bad matchup for a lefty because they're probably a little more comfortable playing with their stick in their left hand, so they'd be better guarding a right-handed player with, with the stick up field. Now, these guys are switching their sticks around and crap like that at times, I, I'm guessing, to play defense. But the moral of the story, I don't know who they're going to put on him. I don't remember who they put on him last year. But whoever they put on him, Virginia or Virginia has a plethora of defenders that could that could make that work and that could do a good job just mirroring him, trying to beat on him, trying to be physical, trying to stay on his hands, and then they're going to have to send help early and often, I think, overall. Uh, so lucky for the Cavs, if anybody has a defender on their roster that you know, or enough defenders on their roster to keep throwing at him to see what works, it's the Cavs overall. Another very important matchup here is going to end up being Jake Naso against Petey Lasala. Now, Naso, I think personally, is having the best year in the country overall as a faceoff man between winning the draws and then putting up points. But Lasala and company aren't that far behind him. Naso is ahead of uh, Lasala in terms of winning percentage. As you see here, Naso's at 65%. Lasala's at 59%. Ground balls, I think Naso is a little bit better. At just a little bit better at winning the 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 faceoff to himself. Although I didn't do the math to to really figure that out, but overall, uh, nay, so definitely the better. Hey, I'm going to win this draw and take it back the other way. Now, in terms of points, Lasala has six goals, so he's got six points to Naso's four goals and two helpers. So that's pretty much a wash right there. I'd call that square. Uh, but there's no fronting on the fact that Naso is the hot guy at the moment. Right now, I do think he's playing better than any other faceoff guy in the country. You just can never count Petey fucking Lasala out. So this could be a fun battle to watch overall. And it will be important to the outcome of this game for sure. Uh, another thing that we've got to talk about here, where I'm optimistic for Virginia – the Cavs' defense has proven that they can handle all sorts of attackmen. Big guys, fast guys, hobbits with insane quickness and agility, a.k.a. the brothers Kavanaugh. Duke has a bit of everything. They have a big lefty bruiser in O'Neal. He's got 29 goals, 23 helpers, and a 35% shooting percentage. He can do it all. They have a twitchy, fast attackman in Andrew McAdory. 22 goals, 17 helpers, 35% shooting. He doesn't have a, a lot going for himself in terms of height, but he's strong. He does a good job at, to, uh, at getting to his spots on the field. So McAdory's a different type of attackman, both top of their game. 
And then they got Dyson Williams, a lefty finisher. That it's a difficult off-ball cover. He can finish, you know, inside ten yards as well as anyone in the country. Uh, and uh, he, you know, it doesn't sound like an upside. After I rattle all that off, it doesn't sound like an upside for Virginia. But the reality is, if anyone can do a solid job covering all three of these Duke attackers, it's Virginia. They have four defenders that I think you could kind of mix and match. And, and, and figure out, hey, who's going to match up better with these guys? They have a couple of guys hanging in that six foot, six one area that are built a little bit more to guard maybe the smaller guys. But like I said, Sawstad last weekend showed doesn't matter who you put him on, he can guard a little jitterbug uh, because he's rangy and he can make up for uh, any lateral steps that he gives up overall just by you know keeping stride with these guys. So UVA, I think or UVA, I think is uniquely geared towards doing a decent job covering these Duke attackmen. Now, where I'm optimistic for Duke. I think that on paper, Virginia has a little bit more quality in the you know the depth that they're going to put on the field, and I think the top guys are pretty even. But I think as you get down into you know your fifth, your sixth best offensive player, I think as you get into your fourth or fifth best defender, same thing with the midfielders. I think Virginia has a little bit more depth in those areas than Duke does. However, I think there's a very good chance that Naso slightly outplays Lasala at, at the dot in terms of winning draws. I wrote draws one with the number instead of draws one, W-O-N. So long as LaSala doesn't put up more points than Naso, let's say LaSala ends up dropping two goals, Naso goes for zip, Naso wins 60% of the faceoffs, but LaSala puts up those two points, then that's that's kind of what LaSala is trying to do here. I don't think he's going to win more draws than Naso. I think he's capable of splitting with Naso, but LaSala both of them capable of putting up points. So how that plays out overall is going to matter. And I think that as long as LaSala, as long as Naso can win 55% of the draws and they're even in terms of the points they put up, then that's advantage Duke right there. Uh, and not only that, I think goaltender, uh, Duke goaltender specifically, Wilhelm, He's been slightly better in cage than Virginia's Matthew Nunes. Nunes has been playing better lately, but Helms' 54% looks a little bit better than Nunes' 51% between the pipes. So long as that stat line plays out on Friday night, that's another slight edge for the Dukies. Now, I think if things if, if things favor the odds, Naso and Nunes slightly outplay their competition, this game is going to come right down to the wire and it'll be decided by two, two goals or less. If either LaSala or Nunes turn on the statistical gods and greatly outplay their counterparts, I think that could be a disaster um, overall for Duke because if Noon stands on his head and makes a buttload of saves, not good for Duke. And if LaSala splits with Naso and then scores two points and Naso puts up none, also not great for Duke overall. So I, I think in the end, prediction Virginia by two goals or less. I think this is going to be a classic Friday night game. But the truth is, this could go. This game could go off the rails for either of these teams, depending on how a couple of these because they're so closely matched. If one matchup just goes a bad way, that's going to change the whole face of the game for each of these two teams here overall. Next game that we've got to talk about: number nine Rutgers versus number seven Johns Hopkins. Now this should be a serious Big Ten battle, uh, as it has more. As I think the Big Ten right now, all of these games have more on the line than they have in previous years. When everyone kind of assumed, well, Maryland's going to roll and win the Big Ten. We're all just fighting for second or third place. It's not that those games weren't important in previous years because you were always jockeying for position for at-large bids for tournament seating and everything like that. But now you're not just playing these games to just jockey for tournament seating and everything like that. You're you're playing these games to try to get the number one seed in the tournament and and potentially put yourself in a position where you could maybe beat Maryland and win this tournament come the end of the season. So a lot more on the line here. Now, both of these teams are getting production from unexpected places. For Rutgers, if you told me that Dante Cool is here would be their leading scorer after nine games, I'd, I'd literally, no joke, would have said, who? Who's Dante Coolis? Uh, but alas, the kid has 23 goals, eight assists, and currently has two more points than the guy I was sure would be Rutgers' leading scorer up to this point in Ross Scott. He's got 22 and seven for 29 points. So school, cool, you know, Coolis has two more points than than Scott at this stage. It's pretty crazy. Brian Cameron's also playing very well. Shane Knobloch. I mean, Rutgers offensively has a lot going for him here. Now for Hopkins, it's less about 
who is doing the scoring and more about how well they're playing compared to my ex- expectations. Jacob Angelus, nine goals, 28 assists. He's done an incredible job quarterbacking the Jays' offense beyond what I thought he would en- end up being capable of doing. Garrett Degnan, 25 goals, two helpers, 38% shooting. He's shooting the ball as well as anyone off ball this year. Whether you need him to finish in close, he can snipe from outside. Degnan has been huge for Hopkins here off ball. And then he got a guy like Russell Melendez, who started out playing attack, had a really great breakout beginning to the season, got injured, faltered a little bit, got moved to midfield, and he's been playing well at midfield as well. A very pleasant surprise to me. And when he's healthy, he's been both excellent at attack and midfield. So just the utility in Melendez is great. Brendan Grimes has been playing better. I think my favorite player on this team is uh, Matt Collison, the freshman midfielder. So lots, lots to be happy about for both of these teams on offense, but it's the unexpected contributors, I think, or the unexpected production that I think has been the story for these teams here so far on offense. Face-offs are going to be key specifically for Hopkins. If we hop in here and we look at this stat line, uh, Tyler Dunn is solid, but that that duo of Dugenio, Jonathan Dugenio, who takes the bulk of the face-offs for Rutgers, and then Joe Newman, who comes in and takes kind of alternate draws to mix things up, they're better overall than Rutgers than Dunn has been for Hopkins. Now, in a game that's more than likely going to come down to the wire, draws are going to be huge, and Tyler Dunn is going to need to be disruptive enough to keep things reasonable. If Hopkins loses more than 45% of the draws, the scales will start to tip heavily in favor of Rutgers because both teams are pretty evenly matched with all other things considered here. Goalkeeping overall, uh, both of these teams have semi-streaky goalies here. Let's go to the goalkeeping section here. I thought I wrote that up. Oh, I did. I just skipped over a spot completely here. So if we look at the goalies, both Tim Marcial of Hopkins and Kyle Mullen of Rutgers are both solid goalies. Mar- Marcial, 53% between the pipes, and Mullen is 54% between the pipes. Both keepers had absolute stinkers in their last outings. I think Marcial stopped just 25% of the shots he faced against Michigan. That was a win for Hopkins, though. And then Mullen only stopped 39% uh, against Ohio State. That was also a win for Rutgers. So they both played like shit. But their teams won regardless of that. So they played terrible. Their teams won. Once again, I was stroking out, and I wrote one instead of one. Weird. All right, that won't work uh, this time around. I think whoever's t- whoever, if either of these teams ends up with a hot goalie, that team's probably going to win this game overall, depending on how the faceoffs go. And I, I feel like faceoffs and goalkeeping, I know they've always been important, but I find myself, I don't know if I'm just paying attention more to those areas of the game uh, this season more than I ever have, or if it really is playing out differently. Now, just because your face-off guy wrecks somebody doesn't mean you're going to lose the game. I think Syracuse wrecked um, the the Hopkins face-off crew. I think they wrecked Dunn, Syracuse did, and Syracuse still lost that game. But the kicker being, if Syracuse didn't wreck Hopkins at the face-off dot, Hopkins rolls and wins that game easily. So, it's we. I mean, it's it's always been that way, but I'm paying a lot more attention to it, and it's been interesting to see how these face-off battles had played into the outcomes of games. So anyway, that's it for that game. I did make a prediction. I didn't make a prediction. So this one, I'm going to fly by the seat of my pants. I'm going to go with Rutgers. I think Rutgers is going to win on the road at Hopkins. Uh, oh my God! What is that? We got an ad blowing up my. Jeez. Man, we got an ad. That's the first time that's ever happened on here where an ad just started going apeshit crazy. So, yeah, I'm going to pick Rutgers. I think it's going to be inside two goals, two goals or less. It'll be a good game. Next game that I'm going to talk about, of course, you know, I'm going to talk about Syracuse. They're playing number three, Notre Dame. Now, I'm going to be a little bit more somber and realistic while I talk about this game this time around here. Normally, I am always optimistic Syracuse can pull it out. For some reason, I never feel optimistic when we play Notre Dame. So I'm going to shoot you straight on this one. I have a bad feeling about this game. I think I'm justified considering how poorly Syracuse has played against Notre Dame over the course of the last five years. So let's just kind of take a look here and I'll I'll tell you how poorly Syracuse has played against Notre Dame uh, since 2015. Notre Dame's got seven wins and Syracuse has two since 2015. In 2022, Notre Dame won twice by a score of 22 to 6 and 18 to 11. 2021, Notre Dame won twice by a score of 18 11 and 22 to 8. So the last four times these teams have played, Notre Dame has kicked the shit out of Syracuse and it has not been fun, either being a Syracuse player, coach, or fan. 2020 didn't play. Thank God for COVID, I guess, in that case, right? 
Notre Dame won in 2019, 13-10. Now, 2018, 2017, Syracuse, they pulled out two wins, a 10-6 win in 18 and a 11-10 win in 2017. But then back 2016, 2015, Notre Dame won 17-7 and then 13-12. The kicker is, these years here, Syracuse wasn't a bad team. These years here, Syracuse was really good. I want to say it might have been this season here. Syracuse was like 13-3. and three. Maybe it was this one, Syracuse was 13-3 when Notre Dame beat them. But like these years here, Syracuse had a good lacrosse team, and Notre Dame still finished 3-2 uh, and two against them. So that's saying something for the Irish. Syracuse has played admirably so far this season. They've won games they should have won, and they've lost the games they should have lost. The Hopkins game, I think, is the one outlier here. I think that's the only game that you could have argued Syracuse could have and maybe should have won. Uh, simply, Tim Marseil had an insane game. Syracuse shot the ball poorly, at least in that way that Marseil stood on his head and stopped a bunch of shots. Uh, but I think the rest of the games, you can make the argument played out as they should. You're going to have a diehard Syracuse fan say, well, that Duke game, Syracuse should have won that. No, that Duke game, Duke should have been up by five to eight goals by the end of that game. But between um, uh, Mark playing well, the defense, I think, overachieved a little bit in that one. We were still healthier on defense at that point. And then uh, Duke hit literally 9, 10, 12 pipes in that game, something crazy. I think that Syracuse was lucky to be in that game and could have eked out a win, but I think Duke should have won that game, and they probably should have won that game by more. So moral of that story here, uh, yeah, you know, Syracuse has played well so far, and they like last year they did not win the games they should have won. That's why they finished under 500. The reason they're 6-4 and four is because they're handling their business in those non-conference games where – they're favored. Uh, Notre Dame looks better on paper in every area of the field except in cage. The other area I think that Syracuse looks a little bit better than Notre Dame is offensive efficiency. I, I think that's pretty uh, pretty positive. Syracuse, I think, has one of the most efficient offenses in the country. They have less turnovers per game than every other team in the country. They lead the country in not having turnovers but they're getting less possessions. So, you know, that that's a double-edged sword there here. They're not they're not turning the ball over as much as everyone because they're getting the ball less, but they are being extremely efficient with the ball. So, I think those are the two areas here. Will Mark 61 between the pipes. Uh, that looks better than Liam Entman's uh, 56% between the pipes, but Entman is a Syracuse killer, and Entman can easily go 70% in a game no matter who they're playing. Mark is legitimately Syracuse's only hope on Saturday against Notre Dame. If he doesn't put up 18 or more saves, there is almost a 100% chance that Syracuse is going to lose this game because I presume they're going to get wrecked at the faceoff dot. Johnny uh, Rakusa, not very good at the faceoff dot. Now, listen, Will Lynch and Hagstrom have not been all that tough for Notre Dame overall, but you got to figure they're coming off playing PD LaSala already. They've already played Maryland. So, you know, they've played some solid teams with some decent faceoff guys. That could draw their stats down a little bit. Now, not that Rakusa hasn't. He's played, he's played a couple of killers as well. But moral of the story, they've been a little bit better at the faceoff dot. So if Syracuse can stay even with the faceoff guys here and kind of split possessions at the dot, that's going to be much better for them, but it will still require Will Mark to absolutely stand on his head because this Notre Dame team is going to get shots and they're going to be a matchup problem for the Syracuse defense. The Cuse defense has been decimated by injuries. Uh, they're very thin. Um, Pat Kavanaugh has been a Cuse killer, and the Orange are without their two best cover guys. Their third defender is now their first defender, and they're asking their top LSM, Sam Alexo, to cover teams' number one or number two options here in settled sets and crap like that. Sometimes I think even bumping him down to close D after a faceoff and, and things get settled. So that's not a good place to be. And to be, to be sure here for Syracuse fans that are like, why are you being so pessimistic? It's because this is the first game since we lost – uh, Landon Clary. Landon Clary went down against Hopkins. Syracuse loses that game. I think if Landon Clary finishes that game against Hopkins, I think Syracuse wins that game. They were playing good defensively. Clary went down, and as soon as Clary went down, he was their top defender at that point. We gave up a bunch of off-ball goals to Hopkins off dodges. It broke the defense for a little bit. They did settle down and finish the game well, but that's going to be a problem because the Notre Dame attackmen are all jitterbugs. You got the two jitterbugs on the Kavanaugh brothers, and then you've got Nelson who's back, who's an absolute off-ball killer. So I think that's not going to play well for Syracuse because this is the first game we've played against a very good team with out without Landon Clary. So, you know, we're dealing with our best LSM 
and our third defenseman covering guys that are probably a little bit outside of their range in terms of ability to cover them. Uh, and you can get away with that against teams like Hofstra, St. Bonnie's, and Hobart. But like I said, this is going to be their first real test since that Hopkins game overall. So the Q's defense, they're about to you know get a real taste of, a, of an offense that features legitimate big boys. Uh, fingers crossed, though, that Will Mark stands on his head, keeps things uh, you know reasonable early on, and that'll give Syracuse a chance to be in the game. My gut is telling me, though, Notre Dame is really good. The Syracuse team is still very young. The, the, the teams that are young have a hard time playing against experienced teams. This Notre Dame team is experienced everywhere. They're deep mids um uh, let's see here i'm gonna go down here and actually tell you who i'm talking about um da -da 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 -da. uh who is it here quinn mccann playing playing as a two-way midfielder here at this point this dude i think played attackman as a sophomore for notre dame and right now he's running two-way he's getting he's playing in defensive sets coming up the field and staying on the field here overall brian tevlin the same th same thing so i mean they've got defensive midfielders that can play offense the brothers Kavanaugh here are killers. Eric Dobson, the big boy midfielder. That's the problem is you're gonna you really usually want Alexo on a guy like Eric Dobson. But if you end up having to put Alexo down low, now you've got someone who's not necessarily cut out to guard Dobson, guarding Dobson. I mean, it's a it is a rough draw here. So I think in the end, my prediction, Notre Dame by five or more goals. I'm hoping Syracuse can stay within that. I think if Syracuse can stay within five, that is a win. To me, being a reasonable Syracuse fan that knows this is a young team and that just, you know, there's a lot of lot of things to be happy about here this season so far, but I just, uh, this game doesn't, it doesn't give me a good feeling overall. And, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry for crapping on my beloved Orange. I'm not trying to crap on him. I'm just trying to be realistic. And if, he hell, if Syracuse beats Notre Dame, I promise you, I will be gassed and I will be going live from my phone on every platform, TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube, and I will send everybody a message uh, with my drunk ass and we'll, we'll all rejoice and sing ha hallelujah. All right, next game we got to talk about number 16, Denver, against number 15, Georgetown. A really big, see what I do here, a really big, Big East Conference matchup for each of these teams. Each team's conference opener, they both sit at four and three. There is a history of these teams hating each other. If it wasn't on Flow TV, it would be a great game to watch. Alas, I already joined the refuse to subscribe to Flow TV for a full year camp, so I won't be watching. I will eat shit and I will subscribe to Flow TV next year. I wish I would have done it this year. But at this point, I, I can't justify subscribing to it to watch a couple of Big East games down the stretch. So I'll get my shit together eventually. Uh, but if I did watch this game, here are the things that I would be watching closely overall. Main thing, Alex Stathakis against James R James Riley at the faceoff dot. Now, this one's going to be important because I do fully expect that Stathakis is going to get the better of Riley overall. The question is, by how much will Stathakis beat Riley? Stathakis sitting at 65%, Riley at just 53%. Now, normally I'd say, you know, that could end up about even because Riley traditionally has been a face-off guy that's put points up, but he hasn't done that this year. I think Riley only has two points uh, thus far this season. So uh, the goal really should be, should be for Riley to just try to split these and get this to 50-50, tie Stathakis up, get the wings in there, try to win that 50-50 ground ball. If he can do that, Denver can be in this game, But I think, uh, and I think that he probably will do that. I think for Riley – it's going to be tough, and I think for Stathakis, it's it's going to be, hey, I'm going to win 60% of the draws in this game. Just keep Riley off the scoreboard, and that's going to be a huge advantage overall for Denver in this one. Uh, the other question for this one, similar to kind of the you know the, the Hopkins um, Rutgers game, whose goalie is going to play better? In this case, I think what you would really say is whose goalie is going to suck less. Sorry to put the negative slant on it, but Denver's had goalie problems for the last couple of seasons, and Georgetown, a team that normally has really solid goalkeeping play, they're scrambling to find a guy that can hang above 50% consistently, even with that really good defense in front of them. That's the problem for Georgetown, is you've got one of the better defensive units overall between, between everybody. All six guys they put on the field defensively are very good, and your goalkeeper still is having a hard time keeping above uh, 53 per, or 50% here if we look at them. Scarfenberger, 47%. Hanks, who is the Dartmouth transfer, who I thought was going to potentially be an All-American, he's hanging at just 52%. The, the, putting the incredible defense in front of Hanks has not translated into him you know, stopping 55 to 60% of the shot. So I think that's going to be uh, important. I do think the advantage goes to the Hoyas a little bit 
overall because I think that uh, they're better both offensively and defensively. So I think that it's going to be the Pios special teams that are going to matter here. Uh, what's your goalie going to do? How many faceoffs are you going to win over Riley and company? And I think that's going to be the factor for Denver. If Denver can't win in the goalie battle and at the faceoff dot, I think Georgetown wins by a mild margin. If those two uh, areas go Denver's way, we've got a ball game and uh, Denver could probably pull off the upset. Next game we've got to talk about here is going to be number 20 Yale against number 19 Penn. Now what's happened to Yale here? They picked up a solid win over Nova, dropped a tough one to Penn State, and then they beat UMass and Denver, and we're like, ah, you know, this is okay. They're 3-1. and one. Their ranking reflected that we still all think as media members that they're going to be a really good team. Two weeks later, they're 3-3, three and three, and they lost their last two games by a combined score of 43-20. to 20. The loss to Cornell had me thinking, all right, 20-10, to 10, maybe Cornell is just that good. But even worse, that loss to Princeton, that now has me thinking, like, Yale may be in trouble. Now, don't get me wrong, things haven't been much better for Penn overall. The Quakers lost two of their first three games, and they've gone two and two since. They managed to beat Princeton by a goal in OT thanks to Sam Handley, but they got their asses handed to them by Cornell, albeit not as badly as Yale. It was an 18-12 loss to Cornell. So how do these guys match up overall? I think defensively, edge goes to Penn. Penn's given up fewer goals thus far, 11.8 per game as compared to Yale's 14.6 per game. Penn's goalie, Emmett Carroll, 54% between the pipes has been a little bit more consistent than Yale's Jared Paquette, 51%. So I think Penn, bigger, stronger, a little bit faster, a little bit more physical on defense, and that's not that's not normal for Yale because Yale, you would normally say they're not necessarily big, but they're strong, aggressive, and you know usually really good overall on defense. But in this case, I think the edge goes to Penn. Offensively, I give a slight edge to Yale. Yale's top five scorers, I think, are only slightly better than Penn's top five scorers in terms of points scored, except Penn's played more games even. So while Yale's giving up more points than Penn on average, their top guys are scoring a little bit more than Penn on average. What I'm trying to say is I think Yale has more offensive depth than Penn, and I'm going to get chirped by Penn fans, I know. Sam Handley leads Penn, averaging 3.71 points per game. Both Matt Brandau and Chris Lyons are averaging 4.5 and 4.16, respectively. Uh, that's that's proof automatically. Yale's top guys have more depth a little bit in terms of quality than Penn's top guys. I'm hoping we see Yale bounce back, though. Uh, the wounded dog usually puts up a good fight. In this case, Penn at 3-4, and four, Yale at 3-3. Three and three. Both of these dudes are wounded dogs. So what happens when two wounded dogs fight? I'm not sure, but we're going to try to find out here on Saturday. And we move on. Oh, my prediction. Penn by a goal. I think Sam Handley scores the game winner, bumps Matt Brando off my top five Twarton list, and firmly plants himself on my list. I said that last week, uh, last Wednesday it was, that uh, Brando is the last player on my Twarton list right now, but that all it would take would be for Penn to beat Yale and for Handley to factor, and then I'll, I'll absolutely bump Brando off of my list and then bring Handley in. And Brando was the guy I thought was the best player coming into the country, and he's just not put up to quite the production uh, that you would need to to have that happen. I think that part of that problem is probably Yale's defense not playing well uh, and them not doing well at the faceoff dot either. I think both of these teams have struggled a little bit at the faceoff dot, so that plays as well. Maybe that's why Brandel's not putting up quite the production he has in the past. Now, I didn't write this one up here because I didn't see this was on the docket here, but this is Sunday's game. I think it's the only game being played, at least in Division One on Sunday, and it is going to be Penn State against Ohio State. Both of these teams early in the season, everyone's like, holy shit, these guys are both killing it. Penn State had both of them at some point flirted with breaking into the top five overall. And then lately, both of them have lost a couple of games here. You see the the stretch here where Penn State became the Ivy League killers. They beat Yale, they beat Penn, and they beat Cornell, and they beat Yale and Cornell on the road nonetheless. So at this point, everybody's like, you know, five and one. Everyone's like, Penn State's one of the best teams in the country. And then they lose to Marquette. That was a, a knock in the face. And then the loss to Maryland is okay, albeit they wanted to beat Maryland for sure. So that's huge. For Penn State, but you can see kind of how they faltered down the stretch. But to make no mistake, TJ Malone, uh, the trainer brothers, Jack and Matt, they've all been incredible here, anchoring this uh, this uh, Penn State offense. And then guys like Chris Jordan, Kevin Winkoff, the Binghamton transfer off ball has been great as well. So overall, 
good things here for Penn State. And then if we look at Ohio State, Jack Myers has disappointed me. I don't know if he's disappointed himself so far this season. I would presume he he was, one once again, I had him listed as a first-team preseason All-American. I thought he was going to have a monster year. And I think what, what we're seeing here is he did lean a little bit more heavily than I assumed off his off-ball guys and his help that he had last year. And they're a little bit younger overall offensively, a little bit more inexperienced overall offensively, and I think that's hurt Myers' production a little bit. So, But then same thing with Ohio State. They started off 3-0 and with that win over North Carolina. We're like, man, Ohio State may be legit. Virginia kicked the shit out of them. They lose to Cornell. They lose to Notre Dame. Notre Dame by a margin, 16-3. to So what Ohio State has shown against the big boys with good defenses, they've had a hard time putting up points. Even against North Carolina, they win it, but they only give up, they, they give up eight goals. And the defense is good, just not good enough to stop teams like Virginia and Notre Dame overall. I think that it's a depth problem. I think when you're playing a team like Carolina that doesn't have kill, you know, six killers on the field at one time, that defensively they're good because they can bottle up the best players that Carolina has with their top defenders. And then after that, you know, all hell breaks loose when you got six killers on the field against Virginia, a bunch of killers on the field against Notre Dame, uh, and then they lose to Denver. If they could have beat Denver, that could have saved the season a little bit for them, especially in terms of trying to get an at-large bid down the road. Not that they're out yet. They still have Penn State, Maryland, Hopkins, and Michigan to play. So they have a chance to pick up, you know, three quality wins in this stretch. But it's going to be hard to pick up all of those those wins overall. So my prediction in this one, I think Penn State at home, I think they're playing a little bit better across the board than Ohio State is, especially offensively. So I think Penn State wins this one by a very close margin. I think we're inside three goals almost for sure. Could come down to a one or two goal game overall. Another big game here, Jacksonville against Utah. If I'm looking at this correctly here, both teams coming off a win. Utah's put three wins together, back to back to back. Utah picks up the win against Air Force at Air Force last night, in fact. And then we've got Jacksonville. They haven't lost since they lost the season opener to Johns Hopkins. They beat Duke, second game of the season. Haven't really played anybody here and they needed everything you know they needed every point they got to pull out a win last night against Cleveland State so i still not sure how i feel about jacksonville overall they've been winning the games that they should win including one that they probably shouldn't have so that's good a good sign for them but this game against utah here is going to be huge goalkeeping play Definite advantage to Jacksonville. Luke Milliken has been much better in cage overall. A little bit streaky, but you, you love a goalie that can get hot, that can win a game for you in the end, even if he's streaky at times. Milliken is that guy, and he is fairly consistent, and and um, Utah's having trouble figuring out who they're going to put in cage here. Face-off dot, that's going to go advantage Cole Brams and uh, the Utah. So I think that between the goalie battle... In the face-off dot battle, that should probably just about even out. I think Utah may have even played a little bit stiffer competition in terms of face-off guys. So the, between the goalie battle and the, the face-off battle, I think that's a wash. It's going to come down to who is going to put up more points uh, in this game. And I think that Jacksonville is probably going to put up more points in this game. You look at Dylan Watson, the, the Georgetown transfer. He's now their leading scorer. Uh, into in, entry area has been very good for him. Waldbaum was injured, hasn't played every game this season so far, but he's kind of back in the mix and he's doing well. Um, so yeah, I think Jacksonville's my prediction. Jacksonville wins this game by two goals, maybe three goals, you know, in the end, but it's not out of the question that Utah could pull the upset. This should be another big game because I believe this is now a, a conference matchup between Utah, uh, UMass and um, High Point. Let me take a look here. UMass, after that loss to Rutgers, they ended up getting picking up a really nice win against Brown here. I think it was Monday night or whatnot. And, yeah, this is a conference matchup. All, no conference games have been played so far in the Atlantic 10, so this is the first big one here, high point against UMass. We got Richmond in the hunt here. St. Joseph's is going to be in the hunt here. So that'll be good overall. Uh, in terms of the goalie battle in this one, Note, Matt Note has been one of the best goalies in the country. I did just give Note a, I don't remember where I put him. I think I put him maybe as a second or third team goalie in terms of my All-American voting here this past week. And uh, so I think that the obvious edge in cage goes to UMass and Matt Note. I think that's going to end up being the game changer also. Uh, we got the Riz King. Uh, the Drip King, the Riz King, uh, hopefully Wifey is still on board. I heard that Wifey may be dumping uh, the, the the Drip King. I hope that does not happen because they're what a wonderful couple. What a, what a beautiful TikTok marriage uh, Caleb Hammett has been with uh, Olivia Dunn, Livy Dunn, baby. So anyway, 
yeah, uh, advantage, I'd say, to Caleb Hammett, to the Drip King, obviously. High Point does not have any drip compared to what UMass has on the field. So my, I'm going to stop it here. The, the analysis for this game is over. Uh, we're going to go, I predict, UMass by two. I'd not only predict that, I predict that the Drip King is going to put up his first point in this game this season. I think that UMass is going to win the game by two or three goals. I think the Drip King is going to absolutely annihilate Colin Hoban or whoever the hell High Point tries to put up against him because and, and because they will have less drip, less riz than Hammett. Uh, I believe UMass is going to win this game. That is my analysis for that one. Uh, sorry to everybody who deserved to get name dropped, but I just I had to go there. Had to go there. Uh, Maryland against Michigan. Eh, you know, Maryland's going to win this game, I think, almost for sure. The, the reason I bring this up, though, is because we got conference play in the Big Ten here. So Maryland handles their business here. Michigan will pretty much officially be relegated to the basement of the Big Ten uh, because, you know, Rutgers, I think, has a better than average chance of beating them. Yeah, that's just a rough stretch here. So, you know, like I had been chirping Michigan for a long time, I said their schedule sucks. Everyone thinks Michigan's arrived, and then they get into Big Ten play, and they go 0 for 5 just about. And this was the year they decided, hey, let's beef that schedule up. This is actually, I think, legitimately one of the, the better Michigan teams that we've seen over the last couple of years at least over the last two years, I think, and you, they end up playing Virginia. They shouldn't have lost to Marquette. That's a stain here, but then you lose to Hopkins and Notre Dame. It's like that, that shit's going to happen, but now they got Maryland, Rutgers, Penn State, Ohio State. So in this one, I think overall, obvious edge Maryland. I think Maryland wins by potentially five or more goals in this game, and that's all I have to say about that. Uh, another game worth mentioning, once again, because we got these middling Ivy League teams. This year, at this point in the season, as the Ivies were getting ready to play each other, they had all annihilated their, their non-conference schedule, and all of them had winning records coming into the Ivy League play. Not the case with Princeton at 3-4, and four, with Brown at 4-4. Four and four. Now, the difference between these two teams, Princeton started off with two weak wins, lost four straight, and then kicked the shit out of Yale here. If we're looking at what Brown's done, they... Started out bad with a terrible loss to Quinnipiac, won three straight, then lost three straight, and then beat Villanova, so a big win. So it's like, I think this is a should be a pretty evenly matched game overall, and I just wanted to talk about it because it's important for the Ivy and the way that the Ivy goes. In this one, though, I predict uh, Coulter Maxey has been incredible. Vardaro's playing better. I predict that Princeton's going to win this game by a small margin. I think they eh, – three to five goals, I think, overall. Even though Devin McLean, Aiden McLean have been great, Devin McLean missed some time where Aiden McLean got to tear it up instead. Even though they've been really good, I do think that Princeton's got a little bit more offensive depth. I think Princeton's a little bit better on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, Goaltender situation – Princeton's a little bit better here, depending on who they put in. Both goalies, though, are above you know, 55% between G and Ficaro and uh, uh, Rackauer. Faceoff dot, Tyler Sandoval, not having a really good year for Princeton. I was always kind of high on Sandoval because there was a couple of situations early last year where he outperformed you know, some really good faceoff guys or at least held, held the line against some of them, and he hasn't been having a great year. Matthew Gunty has, in fact, been good for Brown. So you know, probably advantage Brown overall in terms of faceoff dot, advantage Princeton in terms of Goalkeeping play, I think Princeton's got a little bit more offensive depth and quality, so I think Princeton wins by very, very small margin, but let's call it like three to five, something like that. That's it. I got to get out of here. I got to try to keep these things to 43 minutes because I've been rambling, you know, about just rambling on and on and incessantly or whatnot. So I'll try to cover some D2 and D3 on Sunday's recap show. Note to everybody, as you've noticed, today's show is getting bumped to Thursday now. So the, the preview show that I do every week is always going to be on Thursdays moving forward because I'm doing a section four lacrosse podcast on Tuesdays now. So the schedule now. Uh, for Division One or for college across, the schedule is Thursdays will be the preview show, Sundays will be the recap show, and then for those that like some high school across or for those that are in my area, you know, upstate New York, the Binghamton region, uh, Binghamton to Elmira region is about what it covers. Uh, Section 4 Lacrosse, we will have a podcast that comes out on the Lax Factor channel every Tuesday. So Thursday, Sunday, college. Tuesdays for the high school kids, the Section 4 kids, and that is it. You can go to laxfactor.com if you have team apparel needs for your lacrosse team. We do both men's and women's apparel, uniforms, reversible shorts. You need some shorts with pockets. We do it. All dye sublimated gear, all design, designed, printed, cut, and sewn in America, and um, yeah, 
Go to laxfactor.com. You can request a quote there. And as always, you can go to laxfactor.com, watch our videos there. You can get t-shirts related to the podcast, or you can just get random t-shirts like this dope Garden Gnomes lacrosse t-shirt here. It's just a, a mock t-shirt that I did up because uh, I used to play for a club team, a box team that we called ourselves the Garden Gnomes. Shout out to Nino and uh, for putting that together. And that's it. I'm out of here. I'll be back on Sunday for the recap show. Join me then. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And Hoost is out. The Lapse Factor Podcast.